People have been using cannabis as a medicinal herb for thousands of years, but despite its long history of use and all of the cultural wisdom that has accumulated around it, our understanding of how it takes effect in the body on a cellular level has only really developed very recently. In the mid-1960s, Israeli scientist Dr. Raphael Meshulam discovered THC, which is the main psychoactive constituent in cannabis. And at that point, science really just began to scratch the surface of how cannabis works and how it has such an affinity with the human body and mind, and how it possesses this enormous number of potential health benefits. So THC was identified, isolated, and tested alongside numerous other cannabinoids in cannabis. But it took another couple of decades to figure out exactly how THC takes effect when we consume it. Now eventually in the mid-1980s, a receptor for THC was discovered in the brain and the central nervous system, and it was called CB1, or cannabinoid receptor number one. But the question still remained, why is there a receptor in the brain specifically for accepting the THC compound in cannabis, and could it actually be that the CB1 receptor is actually there for receiving chemicals naturally present in the body? So the research expanded from just studying the cannabinoids in marijuana to looking for cannabinoid-like compounds that were produced in the body itself that also acted on the CB1 receptor. And because the body's own self-produced cannabinoids were endogenous, they were aptly named endocannabinoids. Now it took a couple more years of research before the first endocannabinoid that actually binded to the CB1 receptor was found. And it turned out to be a neurotransmitter, which was called anandamide, which is also known as the bliss compound because it acts as a mood enhancer and it stimulates sensations of joy and happiness. And while anandamide doesn't actually have the same chemical structure as THC, it does bind to the CB1 receptor and it does exhibit exactly the same effects as THC, albeit in a much smaller concentration. A second receptor was also found, and it was called, as you may have guessed, the CB2 receptor. But unlike CB1, this receptor wasn't so abundant within the brain. It was actually found in a much higher concentration in the periphery of the body, and it had a particular affinity with the immune system. So it was found mostly within the membrane of immune cells, and very densely located in immune tissues and organs like the spleen, the bone marrow, the thymus, gland and the tonsils. And it's not just THC that acts on these two receptors, there's many different cannabinoids in marijuana that act either directly or indirectly on these two receptors, like CBD and CBN, and also, you know, you've got a lot of different endocannabinoids that act on these receptors, anandamide and 2-AG being just two of many. As of yet, CB1 and CB2 are the two definitive receptors that make up the endocannabinoid system of our bodies. Although, to be honest, there is still a vast amount of research yet to be done on the 100 or so other phytocannabinoids that are in the plant, and all of the numerous self-produced chemicals in the body that have the same effect. So, it's likely that there's going to be a lot more receptors and a lot more endocannabinoids yet to be found and our understanding of the endocannabinoid system is going to evolve over time. We do know quite a lot already though. We know that it's one of the biggest contributing factors to homeostasis. Now when we look at the dictionary definition of homeostasis, it says that homeostasis is the tendency towards a relatively stable equilibrium between interdependent elements, especially as maintained by physiological processes. So homeostasis is a systemic force where all of our organs, tissues, and bodily systems all work synergistically to find a dynamic state of balance. It's the body and mind's innate ability to always find the center, the point of balance no matter what situation we're in. It's our ability to respond to all forms of stress in a low impact, sustainable way, and protect ourselves from disease as well as heal faster if and when we do become sick or injured. So it's basically like a collective thermostat for every interconnected system of the body and mind. Because obviously, in the modern world, we're facing a tidal wave of chronic stress that over time 
can begin to break down our ability to adapt and respond to stress in a healthy and harmonious way. So we end up struggling to achieve homeostasis and we end up becoming very exhausted, very drained and developing a number of possible health challenges because of that. Endocannabinoids like anandamide and 2-AG are integral to our mental function, stress management and our immune health and our ability to maintain homeostasis. But through stress, toxicity and shitty diet and lifestyle choices, there's a very real possibility that we can develop an endocannabinoid deficiency, meaning that the function of the endocannabinoid system can become impaired. So this is why supplementing with phytocannabinoids from the cannabis plant or using medical marijuana can be very beneficial because from this perspective, cannabis does act like an adaptogen because it does support homeostasis. And this is largely because we already have the organic infrastructure in place to fully utilize the constituents in cannabis because the plant produces a spectrum of bioidentical compounds that are produced within our own bodies, which is very interesting. For example, when THC connects to the endocannabinoid system, it's a supreme pain reliever because it modulates neurological function to reduce pain signals being sent to the brain from elsewhere in the body. It can also cause malignant cell apoptosis and it's a chemoprotective agent and it can dramatically reduce all of the vomiting and exhaustion and all of these kind of symptoms that accompany chemo and radiation treatment and it also stimulates the very withered appetite that very commonly affects people that are undergoing conventional cancer therapy. THC can also offer symptomatic relief to those suffering from asthma and chronic bronchitis. It's shown very powerful effects in reducing and even eradicating seizures in those suffering with epilepsy. It can support our circadian rhythm and really help to reverse sleep disorders like insomnia. And it also acts as a great source of relief for a lot of people suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder. And it acts as a general antidepressant when it's used responsibly. CBD, on the other hand, isn't psychoactive at all, but it is a potent antioxidant and it's an excellent anxiolytic, meaning that it has the power to reduce anxiety, agitation and panic attacks and instill a much more relaxed and stable mental state. So CBD is a bit more of a sedative than THC, so it can be really great for interrupting repetitive, obsessive behavior, and like THC, it does also offer significant anti-cancer benefits. CBN is another plant-based cannabinoid that offers yet more pain relief and anti-epilepsy benefits and it's also very good at lowering pressure buildup within the eyes, which is why there's so many glaucoma patients that are using medical marijuana. CBC works as a support mechanism for THC and generally just consolidates the effects of THC, whereas CBG is an anti-inflammatory agent that again does have some calming sedative properties. Now this is just a small number of the cannabinoids that are in cannabis and while it's tempting to examine the benefits of all of these compounds separately, the truth is it just doesn't work like that in nature because all of these cannabinoids in marijuana, just like the endocannabinoids produced in our own bodies, all of these things have an interdependent relationship with one another. Now some of them are present in minute amounts and they may appear to do very little or even nothing on their own, but when we view them in a more collective and holistic context, it becomes a lot clearer that many of these compounds actually enhance the overall medicinal effect and they regulate and moderate one another which I think is largely why the endocannabinoid system is so integral to homeostasis. Plus, cannabis is a rich source of numerous different terpenes that interact with the plant cannabinoids and actually have an indirect yet very significant influence on the endocannabinoid system. So considering medical marijuana, it's very important that plants are actually cultivated properly, they're prepared appropriately to ensure the bioavailability of the constituents, 
and it's administered correctly according to the desired outcome of the individual, which is really going to vary from person to person. So buying any old shit from someone stood on a street corner is highly unlikely to deliver optimal results that are tailored to your individual needs. But then of course, this leads us to ask the question, why are so many people forced to buy substandard cannabis from strangers on the street? Now the answer is pretty complex and multifaceted, but I think the foundation of that answer is actually very simple and straightforward. Now cannabis is largely illegal because it perfectly mimics endogenous chemicals that are produced within the body that are vital to health and homeostasis. So admitting that cannabis is generally safe and it offers legit medical benefits when it's used strategically and responsibly, admitting that would be utterly devastating to the pharmaceutical industry. So unfortunately for now, we just have to endure this warped corporate bullshit propaganda that straight up denies decades of conclusive scientific research. And instead it just insists that cannabis is still this gateway drug that leads to heroin use and amphetamine use and it's going to turn you into a criminal. Oh.